Today we're going to talk about the internal rate of return. This tends to be a little bit of a um, mystery to, to many sort of non-finance uh, people. It's a little bit sort of alchemical in nature. But once we see through it, it should be really quite uh, a manageable sort of concept. Now the IRR is simply, from a definitional point of view, is the uh, discount rate applied to, to a series of cash flows so as to make the net present value equal to zero. That's simply what it is. It's almost like a, uh, think about it like the a break even uh, discount rate. Now, one of the interesting things about the IRR is that it, in, among its assumptions, it says that any cash flows that are generated in the course of a project are deemed to be reinvested at the IRR rate. And uh, this is usually a kind of uh, a, a, an observation which is glossed over. In other words, people don't stop to pay too much attention to what that actually means. But it does have some practical um, implications. If we were to look, for example, at the following set of cash flows, quite simple ones. Investment of 20000 year one, return is 5000 year two is 30000 um, one can verify that the IRR of those cash flows uh, is 35.61%. In other words, if we were to discount uh, these cash flows for years 1 and 2 at 35.61% and subtract 20,000, the NPV would be equal to 0, according to the definition. Now, notice what happens if we were to um, manipulate the uh, cash flows here, and instead of paying out 5,000, we were to actually reinvest the $5,000 uh, from year one at the IRR rate of 35.61% until the maturity in year two. Then our cash flows would look like this. Uh, instead of uh, 5,000, we would have a year one cash flow of zero. And in year two, we would have, instead of 30000 we would have a cash flow of 36780 The difference being the 5000 that has been reinvested at 35.61% to give us 6780 Now, if we were to calculate the cash flows of the shown under column B, the RR would be exactly 35.61%, the same as in column A. In other words, uh, both uh, profiles, cash flow profiles for A and B are equal to each other, 35.61%. What's also, um, so this, this proves the point that the, uh, that the interim payment of 5,000 is actually calculated as being reinvested to maturity. This has practical uh, consequences for, for uh, investors in funds which claim to have IRRs of a certain level, usually very uh, interesting and attractive IRRs. But if those uh, investments pay out along the way uh, dividends to the uh, investors, like 5,000, um, the actual return the investor achieves will is likely to be less than the IRR rate. In other words, the investor would receive 5,000 out of the project and we're would they put it perhaps into a bank earning deposit interest in the bank and therefore that will bring down the overall return of the investment project. So this is something, uh, a practical implication uh, when looking at um, investment um, brochures and people are talking about the IRR that, uh, that can be achieved from a flow of uh, a set of cash flows. Keep in mind that that implicit uh, assumption or characteristic that the interim cash flows are reinvested or calculated as being reinvested at the RR rate. Good. Um, the other thing which is worth mentioning, and this is, uh, has a nice tie in to the uh, sources of finance and different types of in instruments, is that we can see the cash flow B effectively is a uh, similar to a zero coupon bond. In other words, it's not paying anything during its life only at maturity, a big lump sum is repaid to the investor. That would be, uh, that is the profile that would be typical of a zero coupon. Okay, now, finally, we want to just spend a few minutes on uh, the comparison of the uh, net present value and RR methods. 
Uh, remember, we can immediately set forward, uh, set forth a rule for appraisal methods. Positive NPV projects are acceptable. The higher, the better. And in the case where we may have an ambiguity in outcomes between NPV and RR, the NPV measure is the the king. It rules at the end of the day as to whether to undertake a project or not. Let's just look at some ambiguities. If we have two projects here, A and B, where these are very simple cash flow profiles. 5,000 is invested, 6,000 comes back um, in year one, and in the other project, uh, 7,500 is invested and returns 8,850. We can see here in those two um, cash flows, the IRR of A is higher. However, if the riskiness of those cash flows is such that a 10% discount were to be applied, and we did an NPV calculation of those cash flows, um, it may seem strange, but the NPV of Project B is actually higher than Project A at a discount rate of 10%. If the projects are more... Uh, if the cash flows are riskier in nature, let's say 16%, then the NPV uh, for A is higher. And the break-even rate, where the NPVs are indifferent, is at a 14% discount rate. This is not just purely a numbers game. The candidate is invited to get a feel for numbers and the implications of what it means when we operate on a series of cash flows, making assumptions as to what the discount rate should be, what the interpretation is of an NPV calculation, and what the meaning is of the IRR. Okay. Now, when uh, looking at these kinds of um, cases, people normally say, well, of course, the difference must lie in the fact that the um, the amounts invested are different, and therefore we're talking about apples and oranges when we compare the two projects. Well, let's just look at another case where we have uh, similar, uh, in fact, identical investment amounts at the beginning of the project, but we have over two years now different uh, cash flow profiles. Even in this case, the, uh, the uh, candidate can verify that cash flow uh, project A has an IRR of 20%, but cash uh, flow B or project B has a higher IRR. However, at a 9% discount rate, or uh, for example, uh, the NPV of A is actually higher than B. So this anomaly, again, can exist in the numbers and therefore the uh, a certain ambiguity with regard to um, choice of project. But again, the rule generally is that in the case of um, ambiguity or anomaly or um, mixed uh, conclusions, uh, go for the NPV calculation. Finally, the discounted payback method. Uh, we talked about simple payback before. The simple payback had to do with counting dollar for dollar um, future cash flows coming in against initial investment amounts. Now, the developers of the discounted payback wanted to make an adjustment to the future cash flows, and they said as follows, let's discount those future cash flows and then do the payback calculation to see how fast we can cover the initial investment amount. And that's precisely what this method achieves. So we can see here that the future values are being discounted back at a certain discount rate. And therefore, it's these discounted amounts that are now being matched with or accumulated against the initial investment amount. The simple payback calculation would have provided a period of two years for payback. We can see that 100 plus 100 is equal to 200. So after two years in simple payback, we have um, full recovery of the investment amount. For the discount payback, uh, of course, since the discounted amounts are smaller than the nominal cash flows, the payback period will be stretched out longer. In this case, it will go into year three before we recover the full 200 initial investment amount.